This is a quote. Americans in the early 20th century were largely suspicious of big business and saw the government as their ally. By the later decades of the century, this had flipped. Many Americans now admired business leaders as entrepreneurs and job creators and believed it made more sense to count on the magic of the marketplace to solve, prob to solve problems than to engage government. That's a quote from the book called The Big Myth, How American Business Taught Us to Loathe Government and Love the Free Market. It is co-written by Naomi Oreskes and Eric M. Conway. Naomi Oreskes now joins me for a conversation about this book. Naomi Oreskes is also a professor of the history of science at Harvard University. Naomi Oreskes, a very good morning to you. And good morning to you, too. Your book begins in the early 20th century, the early 1900s. What's significant about this period of time? What's happening in the country? What's significant about this period of time is how brutal and deadly capitalism was. That American workers were routinely killed on the job, and when they were, their families received no compensation whatsoever. Children as young as two years old worked in factories and mills and mines across this country. Uh, if you lost your job, there was no unemployment insurance. If you got injured, there was no workman's compensation. If you were old and retired or infirm, there was no social security. Life was literally nasty, brutish, and short. And much of this was a consequence of the development of capitalism, the development of industrial manufacturing, with very few forms of government oversight and very few mechanisms to address the social costs of capitalism. That changed in the late 19th and early 20th century as reformers began to say, wait, hold on, this isn't right. Young children shouldn't be in factories, they should be in schools. Workers who get injured or killed on the jobs, they or their families should receive some kind of help. And old people who, um, you know, old people should be treated with respect and dignity. They shouldn't be impoverished. And so over a period of time in the early 20th century, and banks, if banks failed, this is important right now in light of the Silicon Valley banks, um, if banks failed, we needed to do something to protect depositors so they didn't lose all their money. And so from a period of about 1890 into the 1930s with the New Deal, a whole set of reforms were put in place designed to address the market failures of capitalism, designed to address the social costs of capitalism. In response to those reforms, a counter movement developed led by American business to deny the need for those reforms, to deny the, the need for the role of government to address market failure, and to claim that we could just trust business, trust the market to do its magic, and everything will be fine. And so in the book, we document that story, and we show how American business leaders work through pop propaganda, through radio, through television, through children's books, and through influencing academia to persuade us of the virtues of the marketplace, um, and as the subtitle of the book says, uh, to love the free market and to loathe government. Tell me about the National Association of Manufacturers, NAM. This, this is an organization that's still very active today and powerful today. A key player in the book is a trade organization known as the National Association of Manufacturers. As you just said, they, they are still active today. They have worked to block uh, climate change legislation. Uh, currently, they've been working to block uh, requirements for SEC disclosures if you're getting materials from conflict mineral zones. So they still exist today, and they're still, in my view, a reactionary force. Um, at the time, though, in the early 20th century, they were the largest trade organization in the United States. They were a major player in fighting many of the progressive era reforms and New Deal reforms that we um, have just been talking about. And But beyond, above and beyond fighting laws they didn't agree with, which in a democracy, you know, that's their right. What they did, though, that we think goes beyond right into wrong, was launching massive sustained propaganda campaign designed really to rewrite American history, to influence academics, to uh, influence textbooks, to make Americans think that we really didn't need government. We could just trust the capitalist system. We could trust big business uh, to solve our problems. And so it's a they really write a kind of counterfactual history of America. And so this is what we document in the book, who these people were, how they did it, and how they really managed to shift public opinion, as you said in the opening, um, from viewing the government as our government, our ally, 
our mechanism for addressing social costs of capitalism and market failures into something that somehow was the enemy to pose big government as the problem. To influence textbooks. Tell me more about that. So that was mostly not so much the work of NAM, but the work of a group called NILA, the National Electric Light Association. NILA and NAM were closely connected, um, but the the, the story of the textbooks is mostly a story about NILA. So in the 1920s, there was a big debate about electricity in America. Almost everybody thought electricity was good. No one didn't like electricity. But the private sector model that had been used to develop electricity in America, which was quite different than what had happened in many other countries, had been very successful in supplying electricity to Americans in big cities like New York, Chicago, St. Louis but had almost entirely failed to bring electricity to rural customers. So this was a classic market failure. The market mechanism didn't work in the rural areas because population densities were low. And so the profit margins were low. And so private sector businesses said, yeah, we're not interested in that. There's not enough profit to be made. Many people felt that was a problem, that rural customers needed electricity. And so a number of reforms were suggested, led by the progressive Republican governor of Pennsylvania, Gifford Pinchot, to develop some kind of government-led system to bring electricity to rural customers. In response to this, the trade organization, the National Electric Light Association, launched a massive propaganda campaign against the government to persuade people, it's really the beginning of this story, to persuade people, trust the free market, trust the private sector, we know best, we can do this efficient, markets are efficient, government is inefficient, and also to attack Gifford Pinchot himself, um, accusing him of being a socialist, a communist, of trying to undermine the American way of life, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the key parts of this campaign was what they called a textbook campaign. So there were lots of facts that supported the argument for government-led electricity. Other countries had done it and it had worked well. And in fact, uh, experts had looked at the United States and compared it to Canada. So right across the border from Pennsylvania in Canada, the government of Ontario had developed a public-private partnership which had brought electricity to rural Canadians at a competitive price. In fact, it was cheaper than private sector electricity. So the facts were actually on the side of government-led electricity. So in response to that, the NILA launched a massive disinformation campaign to deny those facts. They hired academics, science, you know, shades of my previous book, Merchants of Doubt. They hired academics to write dissenting reports claiming that municipal electricity was too expensive, that it didn't work, that it was inefficient, and that it was socialistic. Um, and they hired academics to rewrite textbooks. They identified textbooks that were being used in high schools and colleges across the country, textbooks that criticized corruption in the electricity industry, uh, textbooks that pointed out the market failures, and they hired academics to either rewrite those texts or to write new ones. And then once the new textbooks were available to pressure publishers, and academic departments and libraries to adopt the new text and get rid of the old ones. With the this... campaign, sorry, go ahead. I should just say, and um, the campaign did lead to a bit, a bit of a scandal. Neela was later investigated. And so when the National Association of Manufacturers begins a propaganda campaign in the 1930s, they actually have a conversation about this because they have an idea to do the same thing. They also want to influence textbooks. But then some people point out and said, well, Neela did that. It didn't actually go so well for them. So maybe you don't want to do that. So Neela was just it was just limited to issues on about electricity in, in the textbooks. Is this something that then would stop once they became criticized for it? Because this is the, the idea that free markets are better than government are, is so ingrained in the American idea um, that it would seem to me make sense that this starts at a very early age. Well, exactly. And that's part of the point of the book, right, is to answer. So how did that get ingrained when so many other facts really argue against it? Um, and so the Neela story is part of this because even though later on they are criticized for it, as far as we know, we found no evidence that those books were ever removed from the library or that those books were ever corrected. And they weren't just about electricity, as you just suggested. They begin with electricity, but then it becomes a larger argument about American capitalism and about persuading Americans that capitalism is the way, American way of life, 
that any compromise to the free market system threatens to, you know, turn us into communists and we'll lose our freedom. And then this is the key argument that NAM and others then pick up, that progressive era and New Deal reforms, even if they might seem like a nice idea, like not making three-year-old children work in factories, um, actually, it's a bad idea because it's putting you on the road to socialism. And, you know, today you'll you'll ban child labor, but the next thing you know, you'll lose your freedom. And of course, we see that argument being made even today as Republicans across this country are trying to roll back uh, child labor protection laws. When you're talking about electrifying and getting electricity to rural, rural America in the early 20th century, it's hard not to think about the Internet today and getting people access to high speed uh, Internet. And this is also a time in the early 20th century when you're starting to rel uh, 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 come up with regulations concerning the rail industry. There's been a lot of comparisons between now the tech industry today and, and mm -hmm. the railroads back then. Um, do, do you see parallels of these two times oh, absolutely. now and then? And one, yeah, one of the arguments we make in the book is that if you look at the facts of history, if you look at the facts of economics, you find that markets are very good at doing certain kinds of things. So they're very good at giving consumers a choice of a range of products. I mean, I can go into the grocery store and buy lots of different kinds of breakfast cereal. I mean, they mean none of them may be healthy, but, but you know, or lots of different kinds of jeans or shoes or, you know, fun eyeglasses, right? So markets are really good at offering choices in certain kinds of contexts. And they're also really good at satisfying the needs of people with money. Uh, Milton Friedman, who we talk about in the book, used to like to say that a marketplace was actually a voting booth because you voted, you know, when you bought an item, you know, I buy this water bottle, I'm making a choice in favor of this water bottle. But the problem with that argument is that it's not one man, one vote, it's one dollar, one vote. So markets necessarily respond much more to the needs of the wealthy and the upper middle class, and much less to the needs of the poor and the lower middle class. And so we saw this in the electricity industry because rural customers generally had less money or there was less, less profit to be made, their needs went unserved by the market. And we see this today, for example, in pharmaceuticals, where we have all kinds of expensive pharmaceuticals for rare diseases that are suffered by wealthy white people, but billions of people on this planet suffer very serious diseases for which there's almost no interest by big pharma because there's no profit to be made on it. Many years ago, I was a Capitol Hill reporter, and I remember lawmakers, especially Republicans, but, but probably not just Republicans, but especially Republicans, continually saying that capitalism is at the heart of democracy and of our political system, that you can't have democracy without capitalism, that there are two sides of the same coin that come together. Where, where does this, I, I, I think A, you disagree with that, uh, but B, <laughs> where, where does this notion come from? Right, well, so this is the whole point of the book is to answer that question, where does this come from? And so we show in the book that that argument was consciously and deliberately constructed over the course of the 20th century. And a key part of it had to do with importing neoliberal econ economics into the United States. And that story begins in the 1930s. So in the early 20th century, there was a school of economics known as the Austrian School. It was led by a number of people, but two of the important figures were Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich von Hayek. They begin to develop this argument, the one you just said, that Republicans and also some Democrats quote a lot. And in the book, we point out that it isn't just Republicans, it's Democrats too. They begin to make this argument that capitalism and freedom, capitalism and democracy are two sides of the same coin. And that any compromise to economic freedom, even for something seemingly sensible like restricting child labor, threatens to compromise political freedom, threatens to undermine democracy. Now, we know that this argument is let's just say at best it's grossly oversimplified because the 19th century America was a capitalist system and we had slavery and slaves were clearly not free and women didn't have the right to vote. And in most states, women didn't even have legal rights to own property on their own. So the idea that capitalism by itself guarantees or protects freedom, we know is false. Um, what I like to say about this is that capitalism is a kind of economic system Democracy is a kind of political system, and there are many mixtures and permutations of those mixtures or those two things. It's, you can think of it as a matrix with economics on one axis and politics on another. 
And we know there are many different combinations. So if we look today at, say, the European social democracies, those are mixed economies. They're democracies, but they have a much higher level of government engagement in the marketplace than we do here in the United States. Um, and those people actually are happier and healthier than Americans are. So we actually have good evidence that a more mixed economy works very well. But the argument that these people made and have sustained right up to the present day, and we see it today with Republicans once again trying to eliminate Social Security. Um, this is the third time in my lifetime that they've tried to do that. Um, really, it's based on a false dichotomy. Well, it's based on two things. It's based on mixing or, or conflating the economic system with the political system, which are actually two different things, but also based on a false dichotomy that the only choices we have available are unregulated capitalism on the one hand or Soviet style totalitarianism on the other. And this is the argument that Friedrich von Hayek developed in his famous 1944 book, The Road to Serfdom. So in our book, we show how those ideas were brought to the United States, how they were imported. And one of the ironies we like to point out is that the right wing always liked to criticize socialism and communism as foreign theories. But in this case, they actually imported foreign theorists. So they brought von Mises and von Hayek to the United States. They arranged behind closed doors without any open competition to have them hired at NYU and the University of Chicago. And then they developed a program at the University of Chicago, particularly, which they called the Free Market Project. And they began to hire and support academics, including Milton Friedman, to develop the arguments for this case, for the case that you couldn't have capitalism without democracy and vice versa. And therefore, you should not compromise capitalism in any way, shape or form. And that's the argument that Milton Friedman then makes famous and popular in the United States and that he brings to the White House in the 1980s through the person of Ronald Reagan, who Friedman deeply influenced. Sticking with Ludwig von Mises and Frederick von Hayek here for a moment. Uh, Frederick von Hayek, I think, uh, maybe is a more common name than Lug Ludwig von Mises, but Ludwig von, you know, as you mentioned, Frederick von Hayek wrote the book, uh, The Road to Serfdom, which is a conservative Bible almost. Uh, but but Ludwig von Mises is very important. Um, I, I mean, some would consider him sort of the founder of the ideas of neoliberalism. Yes, many people consider von Mises to be one of the founders of neoliberalism. And von Mises is an important character, and it's an important part of the story, because part of what we show in the book is how important arguments, arguments that needed to be made, became flattened and simplified and really transmogrified into propaganda in the hands of these American business leaders that we're, that we're writing about. So, so von Mises became famous originally with an interesting and important argument, and one that I think was partly right. I mean, all good myths have some kind of kernel of truth in them. So von Mises points out a couple of things. One of the things he points out is that one thing markets are really good at is aggregating information. They tell you a lot about what the people in the marketplace are interested in buying and how much they're willing to pay for it. And that's useful information. And so he says one of the reasons why Soviet style centralized planning won't work, why the Soviet five year plans were doomed to fail, is because they don't have enough information, because they don't have the market as an information aggregator. And that's a really interesting argument, and it's probably right. But then he goes further. He says, so in order to make a five-year plan work, the government has to be coercive because it doesn't really know what people want. So it has to decide for them. And not only that, it has to demand the materials that it needs. It has to order workers to work in certain industries and not others. And so it necessarily becomes coercive. And that was probably right, too. So now he's made two interesting and important arguments that people are listening to. But then he takes a third step that to me is where he goes wrong. He says, and therefore any compromised economic freedom, any compromise at all, puts you on the road to totalitarianism. And that's just a, that's just the kind of, you know, reductio ad absurdum. He doesn't actually have any evidence for that. And in fact, what evidence he did have from Europe and the United States at that size, time, I mean, the United States by then already had the Sherman Antitrust Act, for example, and that was making democracy stronger by restricting the concentration of wealth in the hands of a tiny few, it had made American democracy stronger. And we had other examples as well, other early reforms, um, reforms in England about factory labor that had not compromised democracy in Britain, if anything, made it stronger. So that part of the argument was not supported by 
the facts of history. But that's the argument that the American business people latch on, because that's the argument that they can use to their advantage and say, see, you want to restrict child labor. You want to give workers workmen's compensation. You want an eight hour day. You want us to have to pay overtime if workers pay more than work more than 40 hours a week. But if you do that, if you make us do that, we're on the road to Soviet style totalitarianism. That was an illogical argument. It was not supported by the evidence. But business leaders thought it was great because it supported the argument that they wanted to make in the United States. And so they take this argument to America. They simplify it. They reduce it to this slippery slope capitalism and freedom argument. And that's the argument that they run with, that they promote in academic life and politics, in film, television, propaganda, and a whole host of other ways that we explain in the book. So they are, they are publicly opposing the prohibition of child labor. Correct. Correct. And they want to convince it's right. It's not just about lobbying behind the scenes. They want to convince the American people that even though it might seem like a good thing to restrict child labor, it's going to undermine your freedom and threaten the American way of life. And that's how the propaganda argument works, right? Because it's basically trying to say to the American people, well, you might think that this is a good thing. You might think this is in your interest, but it really isn't. And then they make the same argument about Social Security in the 1930s. You know, Social Security sounds good. Sure, we get that, but it's really bad and you really don't want it. And, and von Mises and von Hayek, they're they're brought over. When you say they brought them over, you're, you're, you're talking about the National Alliance of Manufacturing. And we started off talking about yeah, this. Yeah, National Association of Manufacturers. Yes, literally. Yeah. A group of business people who are affiliated with them and also quite closely affiliated with the DuPont Corporation, literally pay for their tickets and bring them to America and literally meet with uh, academic leaders at NYU and Chicago to get them jobs. And this is another iron of the story. These people are always glorifying competition. Competition gives us the best outcome, et cetera, et cetera. But there's no competition for these jobs. These jobs are not advertised. They're arranged behind closed doors with business leaders actually giving the money to pay the salaries for these two these two Austrian economists. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with Naomi Oreskes. And Naomi Oreskes is a professor of the history of science at Harvard University. She's the author of a number of books. Her latest, which is co-written with Eric M. Conway, is called The Big Myth, How American Business Taught Us to Loathe Government and Love the Free Market. In these early years, throughout the 30s, maybe throughout the Great Depression, there, 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 this argument is being made, but, but it's not really getting much traction yet. How does it become more of a, of a mainstream idea? So there are a few things that these folks that we're writing about do. So one of the things they realize is that they need to influence American religion. They, they know, and they write letters to this effect. So, I mean, this is a documentary history. So everything I'm saying is based on documents, letters that they wrote, articles that they wrote. Um, they Your book is not without that, citations. Yes, lots of citations, right, right. So I just always want to make that clear. This isn't just sort of my opinion, right? These, this is a historical story documented by a lot of evidence. And so one of the strands of evidence involves an American industrialist named J. Howard Pugh. He's the president of the Sun Oil Company, what we know of today as Sunoco. He's a leader in the National Association of Manufacturers, and it's the same Pew as the Pew Charitable Trust today, although their politics are very different from their founder. So Pew is worried because lots and lots of American Christians think that capitalism is unchristian. They know that the message of, message of Jesus was a message of love and compassion for the poor, and they see American capitalism because of its brutality and its lack of compassion for the poor as essentially unchristian. Pew decides that that has to be changed. And so he begins to fund a group called Spiritual Mobilization. It's based in Los Angeles, and its purpose is to realign American Protestants with free market capitalism. And so they begin to do a number of things that kind of recapitulate the textbook campaigns, but in a different context, in the context of American Protestantism. So they work to influence what's being taught in seminaries to try to change the message of seminarians to be more pro-capitalist, pre pro more pro-free market. Um, they start to publish a series of journals, including a journal called Christian Economics, 
again, to align economics with Protestant Christianity. They begin to fund ministers, send materials to ministers to encourage them to give Sunday sermons, explaining why capitalism is, in fact, aligned with the message of Jesus. And there's a great detail in the story. One of the people who they want to hire is Norman Vincent Peale. Peale is on the verge of becoming very, very famous on his own. He's just published the book, The Power of Positive Thinking. And so he actually turns down the job um, because he doesn't really need them. But they do fund other people, uh, including Billy Graham and other well-known uh, evangelical ministers. In later years, two of Peel's parishioners in New York were Fred and Mary Trump. And when Donald Trump got married for the first time, who was the parishioner at his wedding? Norman Vincent Peel. So there's actually a direct connection to Donald Trump, even though our book is not about Donald Trump. So that's one thing, is to influence American religion. And, and we argue that that was very, very powerful and successful in ways that a lot of historians have not really noticed or paid attention to. A second way they tried to influence us was through popular film and television. So we have two chapters in the book that show how they began to work in Hollywood to influence Hollywood films. In the 1930s, in the light of the Great Depression, many Hollywood films were quite critical of banks. Think about movies like The Grapes of Wrath. Yeah. So a new president comes into Hollywood of the Motion Pictures Association, the man who comes out of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and he actually makes a speech in which he says, we will have no more grapes of wrath. Now think about that. One of the greatest books, one of the greatest films in American history, and he begins to work to alter the message of Hollywood films to be more, you know, more praising of the rich, more praising of banks, more praising of American capitalism. And who does he work with to do this? Ayn Rand, the libertarian screenwriter. One of the things that Rand does, and again, another one of the amazing ironies or hypocrisies of these people. So Ayn Rand is famous for libertarian philosophy, glorifying individual freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of action with no limits whatsoever. While she's writing those books and screenplays, she is also writing the censorship codes for Hollywood. And in those censorship codes, there are explicit instructions uh, not to criticize banks, not to criticize wealthy people, not to ever make it seem as if wealth is ill-begotten. You know those cigarette butts that you see every day? They're made of microplastics and they line our streets and waterways. You'll find them on California beaches more often than plastic straws. It's an environmental disaster the tobacco industry caused. You know, the, 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 I couldn't help but think of what happened, and I don't know if this is a part of your book or not, what happened in California in the 1930s when Upton Sinclair ran for governor on the End Poverty in California campaign. A very, he had a lot of momentum, his campaign, but then Hollywood and, and the media industry turned against him, helped sink his campaign. Yeah, we don't talk about Upton Sinclair specifically in the book, but we do talk about the way Hollywood was not just a sort of neutral arbiter of film and then later television, but actually worked with business leaders, particularly the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, to try to craft a pro-capitalist, pro-free market um, and highly individualist message in film and then later in television. And then that, of course, brings us to Ronald Reagan. So shall I talk about Ronald Reagan? Please. So one of the key questions of the book is, how do these ideas, which are not mainstream in the 1930s, in fact, which have mostly been rejected in the face of the Great Depression, how do they come back to life and how do they gain traction and how do they become so influential, you know, in our lifetimes? One of my favorite quotations in the book comes from President Dwight Eisenhower, and it's a reminder of how much the Republican Party has changed since the 1960s, because Eisenhower writes a letter to his brother and says, if any party wanted to eliminate Social Security or the FDIC, you would never hear of that party again. And then he says, you know, there's a small minority of people who would like to do that, but their number is negligible and they're stupid. Well, so that's Dwight Eisenhower. And he writes, when does he write that? In the late 50s. This is in the late 1950s. So the Republican Party under Eisenhower has accepted most of the reforms of the New Deal. They accept Social Security. They accept um, well, Medicare hasn't come yet, but, you know, they will accept Medicare, too. I mean, even Nixon said we're all Keynesians now, right? Correct. And Nixon says we're all Keynesian now, right? They accept the Fed. They accept that the federal government has to play a major role in managing the marketplace, managing the economy. But that changes with Ronald Reagan. 
Ronald Reagan is elected with the slogan, government is not a solution to our problems, government is the problem. And he begins what is a kind of long march for conservatives and in this country to try to roll back the New Deal, to, to try to reduce government support for the poor, to try to roll back and undermine enforcement of environmental regulation. We can throw in rolling back women's rights as well. Um, so how does Reagan, where does Reagan even come from? I mean, in the 50s, Reagan is a second rate actor whose career is on the skids. And by 1980, he's president of the United States. So how does that happen? Well, in the book, we tell that story. And it's a story you won't really find in most Reagan biographies. But it turns out that Reagan spent a critical period of his life between Hollywood and going into politics, working for the General Electric Corporation. Now, GE is a major player in this book because GE had been involved in the NELA textbook campaign. GE was a major player in the electricity uh, markets going back to the 1920s. So they hire Ronald Reagan to do two things. One is to host a television program called General Electric Theater, which each week presents didactic stories of people succeeding through their own hard work, rolling up their sleeves, you know, Horatio Alger type stories um, without the help of government. Many of the stories are about boys who learn to be men by standing on their own two feet, figuring out problems for themselves. And Reagan hosts this program every week. And it becomes very, very popular. It's one of the most popular television programs in the United States in the late 1950s. And it's seen by millions of Americans every week. So through this program, Reagan becomes really, really well known. He becomes one of the most famous men in America. And his persona becomes familiar to Americans in a way that, you know, we sort of take that for granted today that there are these people who are super famous. But in the 50s, there weren't yeah. so many of those people. So he becomes very, very well known to the American people. But in addition, he also plays a role as a spokesman for General Electric. Now, a little background. General Electric at this time was probably one of the most anti-union uh, companies in America. They had been sanctioned several times by the National Labor Relations Boards for violations of the Wagner Act that protected uh, workers' rights to collective bargaining. And they were extremely anti-government, anti-regulation, uh, and pushed the idea of you know the free market as the solution to our problems. And they, they did this in many different ways. They had education programs in their own factories. They had newsletters and magazines that they um, would give out both to their managers, workers in their factories, and also people living in the community, materials aimed at school teachers in communities where GE had operations, and they had Ronald Reagan. So they sent Reagan out on a lecture tour all across the United States where he would play up the virtues of the free market and play down the virtues of government support and protection. And in this time, we see Reagan beginning to develop what becomes his campaign slogan or his campaign speech. So by the time he leaves GE, he has the speech that he's developed, which is essentially the government is this problem speech. And we know in the book we talk about, he sent a copy to Richard Nixon, who writes back and says, this is terrific. This is great. So we see the beginnings of the modern day Republican Party being developed, formulated um, in the sort of crucible of General Electric. Now, two important details about that. So GE executives developed reading lists, and we know that Ronald Reagan got a copy of this reading list. One of the books on the reading list was Friedrich von Hayek's Road to Serfdom and a whole bunch of other uh, pro-market anti-government books that we talk about in our book. Uh, the other key part of this story, though, as well, is that while GE is promoting the virtues of the free market, they are actually being investigated, and they are later prosecuted, successfully prosecuted by the Department of Justice for conspiracy to rig electricity markets. So again, this is how we, we begin to see this isn't just a legitimate or authentic disagreement about people who see the world in different ways. This is a dishonest propaganda campaign by a company that is actually conspiring to rig markets, even while they're touting the virtue of free markets. The transformation of Ronald Reagan is interesting. Before joining GE, he is a New Deal Democrat. He is at one time ahead of 
the actors union and then he comes out very different after his time in GE as, as an economic and religious uh, conservative in fact we even get into this how he's also considered an important figure in uniting the uh, the the conservative the social conservatives to economic conservatives what what was it just this reading list that he had at GE that 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 propelled this this transformation well, you know, there's no way to know for sure, because obviously we can't get into his head. And most of his biographers don't even discuss this period uh, that he spent at GE. And the Reagan family has not allowed scholars to look at any of the materials uh, from this period in Reagan's life. So there's no way for us to know for sure. There's some evidence that he was already um, maybe a little soured on the New Deal before before the 1950s, that his politics were already beginning to change somewhat, but he was still the president of a major union, the Screen Actors Guild. The key transformation, the really key change takes place in this period when he is at GE. And the other key thing that happens at GE is that he becomes friends with a number of GE executives, and these executives then become the core of his kitchen cabinet, uh, financially supporting his campaign when then he makes the decision to run for governor of California in the 1960s. I do want to follow up about the, again, the, the melding of uh, religious or social conservatism to, to economic conservatism and this sort of bringing you know, the Christian economics for capitalism. What, and I know you're not a priest, you're a scientist, <laughs> um, but do you have a sense of sort of what, the theological reasoning was or or what they were saying that Christianity taught about economics? Well, yeah. So um, in the book, we have a chapter on this movement. It's called Spiritual Mobilization. And so in a way, it's a kind of revival of the gospel of wealth, which was an argument that had been made in the 1920s by social Darwinists who argue that if people are rich, it's because God has favored them. And actually, that's an argument that you can even find back in Puritan American. So it's an old line of thinking in American Protestantism, but that then gets revived and reestablished in the modern era. So God looks down favorably on wealthy people. That's why they're wealthy. Um, and it's also based on a contrast between godless communism. And again, it, it, it builds on, it's based on creating a false dichotomy. So one of the things they do, and remember, this is the 1950s. So this is the period of Joe McCarthy, you know, high pitch, high fever anti-communism in the United States. So on the one hand, we have the Soviet Union, which we know is godless and persecutes religion. And we know that it's founded to some degree, although one can argue about this, but to some degree on Marxist Leninism. And Marx famously said that religion was the opiate of the people. Yep. So there's no question that the Soviet Union is anti-religious. So they say, well, look, the Soviet Union is godless and anti-religious. Capitalism is the opposite of communism, and therefore capitalism is what God wants. Capitalism is where you'll find God. And so, again, it's the false dichotomy that if the Soviet Union is godless, then capitalists must be godful. And so it's based on building this idea that there's a kind of natural alliance between American capitalism and American Protestantism. How significant, we mentioned him before, but we haven't really talked about him yet, uh, is Milton Friedman. Uh, this, this, he comes from what's called the Chicago School of Economics. Milton Friedman is very significant because he's part of how these ideas are made mainstream. Because one of the problems that the business leaders that we're talking about faced, I mean, one problem I've already said is their arguments are not true. <laughs> and in, many, in some places, we see them actually acknowledging that in small ways here and there. Um, there are places where they actually do, usually they refer to what they're doing as public relations, but there are places where they slip and they call it propaganda. Um, so the arguments aren't really true. And I think that in their hearts, most of them know that. Uh, and the other pro a second problem, as I've already said, is that it godless, you know, what should I say, uh, merciless capitalism doesn't seem very Christian, so they work to change that. Um, but the third argument is that they don't really have academic credibility because coming out of the Great Depression, as you said, Richard Nixon, you know, later years say, we're all Keynesians now. The idea of just leaving everything to the marketplace seems to have been completely refuted by the stock market crash of 29 and the Great Depression. Capitalism has failed spectacularly. Uh, a quarter of the American people are out of work, the Great Depression has spread globally, markets are collapsing everywhere. And to just say, oh, well, the markets will do their magic. I mean, that's what Herbert Hoover said, and he was voted out of office because of the patent absurdity of saying that 
in light of what was actually happening on the ground in the world. So after World War II, the idea of government, really major government action in the marketplace has gone mainstream. And so the big problem then that these business leaders face is, well, how can you persuade people that the New Deal was a mistake? How can you persuade people that the government shouldn't be doing all these things when during the Depression, it was obviously necessary? And so a big part of that has to do with building up an academic argument to support this free market argument. And the venue for that, the key venue for that is the University of Chicago. So as I've already mentioned, one of the things they do is arrange for Friedrich von Hayek to be hired as a professor without an open search at the University of Chicago, but then also to fund something they called the Free Market Project. And the idea of the Free Market Project, there were a few different things, but one of the key ideas, which again, is they write about in their letters, is to say they want a blueprint for what they want American society to look like, a blueprint for American capitalism. And initially their idea is that von Hayek would rewrite the road to serfdom, but he would write it in a more American uh, register, that the book he wrote was too highbrow and too European for an American audience. Now, in the end, Hayek doesn't write that book, but Milton Friedman does. And it's the book Capitalism and Freedom. And Friedman does not acknowledge this in the book, but he does acknowledge that it was based on a lecture series he gave. And that lecture series was funded by a libertarian foundation, the um, William Volcker Foundation, which is tied to this group of same the same businessmen who have brought von Hayek and von Mises to America. So the same people who bring Austrian economists to America then build up the Chicago School. And capitalism and freedom is hugely influential because it essentially takes the argument but simplifies it still further, focusing on this key argument that if you compromise economic freedom, you lose political freedom. And that's how they fight back against the New Deal to say, well, it may have seemed like a good idea at the time, but actually it's a bad idea because it'll put us on the road to totalitarianism. That book is has almost no evidence in it, almost no data, but it is very well written. It's very well argued and it becomes a bestseller. And then these groups do a lot to promote it. They distribute free copies. They send copies to libraries. They help to fund a television version of it that runs on public television um, in a few years later. Uh, Freeman gets a regular weekly column in Newsweek magazine. He becomes an advisor to Margaret Thatcher, and he becomes an advisor to Richard to um, Ronald Reagan. And so his influence is built up through this network of support, um, which is not actually mostly made up of other academic economists, but it's really a network of business leaders who help to promote and sustain these arguments. And then with Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher to bring them into mainstream politics, both in the United States and in the United Kingdom. So Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom sounds like this This really solidified this argument uh, in, 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 in this process of connecting democracy to free markets. Exactly. Yeah. Naomi Oreskes, in your book, The Big Myth, uh, there, there are many moments I have where my eyebrows would raise. I'm like, oh. And, and one of those, and I want to ask you about a person in a TV show. The person is, who was Rose Wilder Lane? And, and tell me about the little house on the prairie. Well, this is an astonishing story, and lots of people have asked us about it. So millions of American children, particularly American girls and young women, grew up reading The Little House on the Prairie books. Uh, we love those books. They're beautiful books, or they seem to be. And it was made later into a very popular television uh, series starring the dishy actor Michael Landon. It was always so, on when I was a kid. I know. It was on in reruns for years and years and years. Right. So these books were marketed by the publisher as the true life stories of Laura Ingalls Wilder growing up on the American frontier. But in fact, they're not actually the true life story. And they weren't actually written by Laura Ingalls Wilder. They were actually written by her daughter, Rose Wilder Lane. And what the historical evidence shows was that um, Laura would make rough notes about incidents that had happened in her life, but it was actually her daughter, Rose, who then crafted them into stories. Now, who was Rose Wilder Lane? She was one of the three most influential libertarian thinkers of the mid-century. Uh, she was associated with Ayn Rand for a while, they were friends. Um, she was a friend of Herbert Hoover. She was a friend of J. Howard Pugh, who we were just talking about. And she herself had written a libertarian 
tirade is really the only word to describe it. It was called The Discovery of Freedom. And it was a book that was so libertarian that even Ludwig von Mises, the founder of neoliberalism, thought that it was like too far to the right. And he actually accused her of being an anarchist or a crypto anarchist. Um, it's basically a book that argues that no government, I mean, it really is sort of anarchistic, that no government uh, can ever be good because government always takes away people's freedom and that's always bad. So she takes her mother's stories and she crafts them into libertarian parables of success through individual hard work with no help from the government. Well, of course, this is untrue, and it's untrue on at least two levels. First of all, the Wilders, like all colonial settlers in America, had huge amounts of help from the government because they wouldn't have been there without the Homestead Act, and they wouldn't have been there if the government hadn't removed indigenous peoples from these lands. So there's no way that this is actually a story of individual um, initiative. And also, and more, well, they're both tragic because of the the federal removal of indigenous people, of course, is a tragic story. But in addition, the Wilder family was not actually successful. Their true life story of their attempts to succeed on the frontier was a story of tremendous hardship and multiple failures and retreats. So she takes a story that actually is rooted in the federal government, turns it into a story of individual success, and she takes a story of failure and turns it into a story of success. And these stories sell millions of copies and are read by millions and millions of American girls and some boys growing up. Here in this stunning sunshine city where borders bump up against themselves and cultures collide in a euphoric dance of audacity, here is where you will find the courage to look past the precipice and see what is out there. To chase your curiosity forward and bring everyone else along for the ride. And all you had to do was see the possibilities think a little further and step into the known. You see San Diego. Is this message, is this anti-government message apparent in the TV show? I mean, I certainly saw it. I wasn't thinking about it. I bet yeah. most people weren't thinking about it. Um, but, but, but I think the TV show less, I went back and watched some episodes as part of this. I think the TV show is less strident than the original books. And I think that makes sense because the original books are written by Rose Waldo Lane, who is this strident crypto anarchist libertarian. Um, the television show, you know, is a Hollywood product. It's a bit calmer and a little more moderate. Um, and it's also in a later time period, but it is still very much focused on the, the patriarch, the patriarchal family and the, the figure of a loving. It's, it's a nicer story. Well, I mean, in both stories, in the books and in the TV, the father is portrayed as this very loving patriarch um, who he may well have been. I mean, I don't, I'm not challenging that. Um, so I'd say the television story is a little bit more focused on the importance of the nuclear family, but that's in the books too, of course, but in a way that's part of the story too. You don't need the government. All you need is a strong family. And of course, that's a refrain that we hear in conservative circles, you know, very much today. And again, the book, the, I, I think the book when it was popular was a little bit before my time, but it was very popular. I mean, I just think popular. Of the TV it's one show. of the most mm -hmm. successful children's book series ever published in the United States. You, you mentioned social Darwinism before. Is is social Darwinism a significant force in this transformation that we've been talking about in the 20th century? I think it is. You know, one of the most challenging questions we often get about the sort of kind of things that Eric and I write about. We got asked this when we wrote Merchants of Doubt, and we've been asked it again now. You know, what do these people really think? You know, are they really that callous, that heartless? Do they really think that two-year-old children should be working in factories? And it's always a little hard to answer that question because, you know, a historian, you don't have access as a historian into someone's inner brain space. But what you do have is the evidence of what they said, what they wrote, and what they did. And one of the interesting things that falls out in this story, if you look at the materials from the 1920s and 30s, there are materials that make it clear that many of these people are social Darwinists. That is to say, they believe that people are not equal. This is certainly true of Rose Wilder Lane. I mean, she's absolutely explicit in her book that she thinks egalitarianism is idiotic. She and others think that it's patently obvious that people are unequal, that anybody whose eyes are open can see that people are different. And this is the key logical slippage. She uses difference to argue for inequality. Whereas, of course, anybody who knows anything of enlightenment knows that the whole argument of about equality is not about that we're all the same. It's that we should have equal dignity and equal equal dignity in the eyes of God, 
and equal rights in the eyes of the law. But they don't really believe that. They think that people are unequal and therefore that it is appropriate that, you know, workers in factories should be paid much, much less money than managers. Um, and they think that children who are working in factory, they're mostly the children of immigrants. And you see places where this comes out, where they suggest, well, it's sort of the natural place. It's their place in life that they work in factories. And some of this harkens back to 19th century British class um, class prejudice. Um, you know, the factories where the working class are to be found, and that's that's their place in life. And the idea that you should send these children to schools so that they could better themselves or have different opportunities, that's not an idea that most of these people really take seriously. So there is a deeply rooted belief in inequality in many of these arguments, not all, but many. Um, and of course, there's there's a you know there's a racial element of this as well. Although in our story, the racial element isn't really the main one most of the time because the people we're studying, they're mostly fighting, you know, the workers they're fighting are mo mostly unionized workers who are mostly white. Because of course, one of the sad aspects of the American union work movement is that often uh, some of the major unions were racist and did exclude black workers. So the issue of racial inequality comes up less. It does rear its head from time to time, but the issue of class inequality is definitely um, structuring much of the thinking of many of these people. And I would argue that it's still there today. It, we don't talk about class in America very often. We like to imagine that we're a classless society. Um, but if you look at the recent things that have been said about child labor by the Republicans who are trying to roll back child labor laws in this country, many of these are, once again, children of immigrants. And you hear people say things like, oh, but they need to work to help their families. In other words, subtext, this is their place in life. Naomi Oreskes is a professor of the history of science at Harvard University. She has joined us for a conversation about her book, which is co-written with Eric M. Conway. The book is called The Big Myth, How American Business Taught Us to Loathe Government and Love the Free Market. Naomi Oreskes, thank you for taking time to tell us this story today. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. <laughs>